parlerò in italiano, eh, e un po' in portoghese, che sono due lingue di tradiz tradizione internazionale rinomata, non sto scherzando, e quindi mi sembra giusto. Também para agradecer a presença do professor Manuel Portela e eh, Antonio Rito, eh, Antonio Rito Silva, da Universidade de Coimbra e Universidade de Lisboa, che sono venuti qui eh, a parlarci di una problematica che si inserisce molto bene in quello che abbiamo già detto, in quello che diremo, e che può portare, credo, delle riflessioni nuove inter interessantissime. Eh, you kill our Jane, aveva detto prima la nostra collega, e quello che hanno detto tantissimi, non solo lettori, ma anche studiosi in Portogallo attorno agli anni 90, you kill our Fernando. Mm? Perché quando è iniziata la riflessione eh, critica, l'edizione critica di, di, di Fran Pessoa, a partire proprio dal 1990, ci sono state delle, delle reazioni, ripeto, non solo dai lettori, ma proprio dall'ambito accademico molto forti e feroci, tali che oggi, tra l'altro, esistono doppie, triple circolazioni delle opere di Pessoa, alcune maggiormente legate a criteri scientifici, altre forse meno. Perché? Perché Pessoa, questo lo, lo, penso che sia di pubblico dominio, è un caso limite da un punto di vista della filologia d'autore, eh, per motivi noti, per il fatto che insomma, ha lasciato una, un archivio molto ampio e quasi completamente posto. In questa, diciamo, estremizzazione, eh, questo estremo, scusatemi, che già Pessoa rappresenta, un eh, libro di Sassuego, Book, Book of Disquiet, il libro dell'inquietudine da noi, rappresenta il punto massimo. Eh, chi ha letto anche le edizioni italiane, la prima molto bella che pubblicò Tabucchi con Maria Giuseppe Lancastre, sa perché, no? Perché c'è questa virtualità di struttura, no? Questa possibilità di riorganizzare costantemente. Eh, nella prima edizione si diceva si potrebbe costruire, ogni lettore potrebbe costruire la propria edizione con, come, con delle carte, no? Ed era un periodo in cui ancora non erano completamente intuibili le potenzialità eh, degli strumenti che oggi utilizziamo. E, Chiaramente, quindi, l'idea che loro ci presentano, io un pochino già ho letto, di edizioni virtuali multiple, di un archivio dinamico, è forse eh, una delle poche possibili soluzioni che riescano a tener conto di questa pluralità, che è una parola che a Pessoa piaceva tanto, eh, e però anche riuscire a ricostruire una, un percorso, hm? uh, di, che è genetico, ma che poi è anche editoriale, è molto molto vario. Quindi io ringrazio e do la parola al professor Manuel Portel. Uh, grazie. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I also want to thank professor Paola uh, di Tali for, uh, for having invited us here. Thank you, Timone, for uh, the introduction. Uh, so actually, you probably uh, realized from the introduction that uh, the problem that we are up to is um, uh, unsolvable, no? Uh, the title of the project actually is No Problem as a Solution. Uh, and so I think that we are about to fail as we publish the, <laughs> the, the, the final result of our project. But the, um, the whole idea was to see uh, if we could come up with a new way of uh, creating a digital archive. And the uh, Book of Disquiet seemed like the ideal work for this experiment because it's a work, uh, as you know, that uh, is fragmentary. Uh, it was unfinished. Uh, we have four major versions of the work uh, that have been published since 1982. Uh, and new editions keep uh, appearing. Uh, even the editors who've done these editions continue to change. Uh, their minds and uh, uh, rearrange fragments, include new fragments. So the book is actually very unstable. And so uh, we thought, well, let's see what we can do uh, to, as a way of editing this book that goes beyond the uh, usual way of thinking about uh, uh, edition. So we're going to divide our presentation into two parts. Uh, the first part I will address the conceptual uh, aspect of the archive and uh, what, it, what it means to call it a dynamic uh, digital archive. And then in the second part, um, my colleague, Professor uh, Antonio Rito, uh, who's the programmer of uh, the archive, will talk about some of the uh, technical 
aspects uh, to show you how we uh, are dealing with um, XML uh, TEI structure of the uh, texts in, in a way that allows us all the dynamic functions that we want to uh, perform. So what is the L2D archive? Uh, we can say we can describe it as uh, a, a dynamic digital archive of this libro uh, de uh, inquietudine, inquietudine, uh, the book of disquiet. So this this work was uh, the earliest fragments date to 1913, uh, the late the late fragments date to 1935. So Pessoa kept working on this uh, book uh, for uh, a long time. There are maybe two major periods of production and then there's an interruption in the 1920s, but there are two uh, uh, groups of texts that actually have been attributed to different heteronyms by Pessoa. But materially, this is um, a set of, this is an unfinished work. No, it's made of a set of fragments. Um, we have facsimiles uh, we, we have the, the, the documents, and we have documented in digital facsimile uh, in our archive all those documents. The documents include uh, handwriting, so manuscripts, sometimes in a very early stage of composition. Also, typescripts. Uh, so, uh, we, I would say that maybe half of the uh, materials are typescripts, and another half are uh, manuscripts. And then, Manuscripts sometimes have layers of revision. The same with typescripts. So we have typescripts that have uh, hand, handwritten revisions. And then we have 12 fragments that have been published. Uh, those uh, were published at different times during uh, Pessoa's lifetime. So in some cases, uh, we only have the published version uh, for those 12 fragments. In other cases, we have the typescript and the published version. And there is one or two cases in which we have the manuscript, the typescript, and the published version. So you can see the way so worked uh, through the uh, various stages. Uh, the work, although, uh, as you know, Pessoa left most of his, pa most of his papers uh, in a large uh, trunk, no? the famous Arca, no? so it's kind of uh, the treasury arc, <laughs> uh, with more than 30,000 papers. And those papers have been uh, edited since, since 1935, really, no? and they are still uh, publishing new uh, materials. So they're still reading and trying to organize uh, new texts from those. Uh, the Book of Disquiet only came to light in 1982. So the first edition uh, was in the early 80s. And since then, there have been uh, another three major editions. So they're not, uh, they're, they're not scholarly editions uh, uh, in the of, of the same stature. No? Some are more minimal critical editions, other are more extensive. But uh, the, the thing about the four uh, expert, what, I, what we call expert editions in our archive is that all these editors have worked through the uh, actual documents and they've tried to make sense of the documents. So we can say that the Book of Disquiet is really a co-construction of Pessoa and edit, the editors. Uh, and so what we wanted to do in the archive was to represent both uh, the genetic uh, history of the uh, autograph materials and the editorial history. So we wanted to integrate the two uh, representations so that we could see uh, the history of the edition of uh, the Book of Disquiet. So uh, the, 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 the encoding that we have devised represents uh, these uh, two levels. But because we, are not, we were not uh, uh, satisfied, it was not a difficult enough problem for us, <laughs> we decided to create a, a third level, which, which we call the virtual level, in which we would allow uh, the users of the archive to experiment with new arrangements of the book. And so the idea, the idea is for uh, when, when we have it published for uh, readers, both experts and non-experts, to be able to do their own selections 
and organizations of the fragments. Uh, so these are the two major goals. No? Another goal is to create a virtual archive that allows both experts and non-experts to experiment with the production of further editions of l 2 uh, thus using Web2 collaborative affordances to expand the field of interactions between readers and texts. So this is an animated diagram that uh, allows you to understand what we're doing. So we have facsimiles, transcriptions, and editions, so we can go in the archive, it's an environment where we can go from single facsimiles to their transcriptions to their place in a given edition. This is the first edition, we are representing the transcriptions and the structure of this edition. Uh, Teresa Subral Cunha is the second edition, again it's represented uh, at those levels. Uh, Richard Zenith, the third edition, uh, and finally uh, Geronimo Pizarro, the fourth edition. Uh, and then uh, we have our own transcription. We have uh, decided uh, not to make an edition as, as such, although the transcription is also an edition. We are uh, encoding the total sum of all the fragments that have been considered by the different editors, but we are not arranging them in any particular uh, structure. So we are, uh, the, 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 the users, when they go to the authorial witnesses and our transcriptions and encodings of those witnesses, will uh, encounter uh, the, 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 uh, the, the library references, which is a random uh, classification. And so the virtual edition, uh, which is the bottom uh, circle there in the diagram, uh, will allow readers to enter the archive and select uh, fragments as they are present in one particular edition. So as they are in one of the four critical editions or in our new uh, transcription and encoding and um, add them to their own edition and arrange them and organize them. Uh, and then they can decide to keep it private or make it public. So registers will be able to uh, give a name or, and a number to their edition and, and present their edition. So what is a virtual edition in the context, in the context of the L2D archive? Uh, a virtual edition is an edition created by users uh, individually or as part of a community based on the scholarly transcriptions of the fragments contained in the archive. So we are not allowing uh, users to retranscribe the texts, they're only able to select uh, fragments and transcriptions that are already in the archive and arrange them. So these this collaborative editors, as we call them, the virtual edition participants, define their own edition by choosing and ordering the fragments. They can also annotate the selected fragments by means of tags and comments. So, and this is a, a, a diagram representing the, the virtual level of the archive selecting and ordering fragments, annotating fragments, and uh, annotations can uh, uh, be tags and comments and also what we call taxonomies. Uh, some of them are ad hoc taxonomies, other are assisted taxonomies that will have um, an algorithm for assisting uh, readers to uh, define the topics and assign a semantic uh, uh, classification to the uh, fragment. Uh, and so here I end my uh, part and I give the word to my colleague. Okay. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, I'm going to present, I'm going to skip this part, so I'm going to move to the tool. So, to have, you have an idea about the tool. Uh, what Manuel has been presenting. So, I'll try with the with the server that is available online. Actually, you can, we cannot already use this because it's still uh, under development. Basically, um, I think most of the, the fragments are already encoded but have been uh, assessed, checked, and corrected. So, uh, so, if you go there, you'll see a password, but not in the future. Uh, so, what, what you can see there? So, this is the the entry point, and you see there the four editions, uh, the expert editions, and I can choose one of the editions, for, for instance, Richard Zenit, and then we'll see here 
all the fragments that Richard Zernet decided should be part of the book of uh, this quiet. So these are the, the, the fragments that are already encoded. And this is the number that uh, Richard Zen has assigned each, each one of the fragments. And you can also see the page. And this is the um, heteronym that uh, was assigned uh, by Richard Zenit. But we'll see Richard Zenit considered that all the fragments are from Bernard Suarez. So if I pick one of them, OK, if I select one of them, I will see the transcription there of the document, uh, of the fragment. We'll see some meta information there. And here, we'll see how this fragment is being used by the, the editors, the other editors. So we'll see that, for, for instance, well, the first thing that you can notice here is that uh, uh, um, the first editor didn't decide, decide that this is not part of the, only three editors d decided this this fragment to be part of the book of this quiet. So if you, and there, this is the, um, the authoral source. So actually this acronym is for the, the, is the identification that the National Library in Portugal uh, assigned to this fragment. So I can just move, and so it's number 20 in the Richard Zenit uh, edition, but this is 327 in uh, Teresa Sobral Cunha. And I can see that probably that's not so many, is not really different from Teresa Sobral Cunha. And this is for Gerardo Pizarro. But then I can compare them. And to compare, I, I select both and I see the differences side by side between the two transcriptions. Okay? And I can also compare it with the source. So, and this is the difference with the, to the source, okay? I actually, it allows me to compare three, but then you have a problem of uh, how to present this, because it's nice to put one side by side, but when you have three, actually, uh, we are working with a more uh, usable way to present when we have several, uh, we are comparing several uh, versions or several interpretations of the same fragment. And then you can just look at the, at the source and you can compare with the facsimile, okay? And then you see side by side the transcription of the source, the facsimile there, okay? And you can just say if it deleted something or replaced something, which actually this is not the case in this document. So I didn't pick the one. Let's see this one. If okay, we'll see something happened here. Yes. Uh, okay, you'll see that some difference there. Some disappear. So let's see the, the facsimile. I'm short sighted, so okay, we'll see. Okay, it's there. All right. So we'll see, and what is there? Ah, okay, it's there, okay, it's there. And actually we have uh, uh, an information that is, it was removed and overstrike in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the source, okay? So this is the part where you can play with, with comparing the editions and the sources and compare them. Then we can move for the, the um, virtual edition. And actually, we already have here. Oh, I can move to English, but probably it's similar. Uh, OK. So we have virtual editions there. And so these fragments, someone that created a virtual edition decides that this is the second fragment in, in his own virtual edition. So, but when you are in, a, in the context of a virtual edition, you can add information, and actually you can just tag something, and you say, okay, let's say that I have a tag for, uh, I was born, okay, here, save, here I need to refresh this, and then you have born there. 
Okay, and then you start using tagging. You, st you can use some kind of tagging and writing comments uh, in the context of the virtual edition, not in the context of the expert editions. Another thing that we have done recently, and actually we didn't present this one year ago, is we use some kind of uh, algorithms called topic modeling, and you can apply in the context of a virtual edition, you can apply this algorithm to the set of fragments, and this algorithm just uh, groups the fragments using uh, correlation between words and generates something like this. So this, according to the algorithm, this fragment is correlated with other fragments through the word homem, homage, and intelligentsia. This one about dream, life, and dreams. This about sun, uh, mountains, and uh, eyes. Okay, and if I choose this one, I will see all according to this algorithm, so that's a taxonomy, according to this algorithm, which fragments are related, have some kind of relation. So in the future, we think that we can probably play a little bit with these idea, because today there are a lot of um, uh, knowledge capturing algorithms. So it would be nice to provide this to end users so that end users can use these algorithms to try to infer some uh, information, some automatically some information from the, the, the fragments. And I think it, this is basically the main idea of this. I thought that would be interesting to show you a little bit how we built this. Okay, now, now how would we use this? How we expect people to use this in the future? But how it was built in the sense that how people encoded this and, um, and so I'll come back to the slides. And, okay. So this is rather technical, but, um, but, but don't care too much about it. So the main idea is that you only have the scholar that is the person that is going to look to encode. So, so far we have been working as scholars in the sense that we have be, been encoding the fragments and moving to somewhere. I, I'll tell where. And then you have this, the browser. You have seen the, inter the interactions through the browser. So we expect the end users or any people, it doesn't to be an ex-scholar or an expert, just can create their own edition, okay? So now I'm gonna show you the, a kind of workflow. So workflows of people working on top of this platform. So the first workflow is the scholar encoding work. That is what people have been doing and still doing till probably the uh, mid of this year when they finish this work. And so the idea is, so the work was something like encode, import, visualize, and correct. That's a mistake there. Uh, so the first thing is that the scholar encodes. So why are you, we are using the, the typical tools, TEI tools for encoding. So our encoders basically was two person that were being encoding this for most, almost two years. Two years, yeah. Two years now. So, and they use a tool that is used in the community, pretty much um, really used a lot of, I think it's the, tool that the community uses more, which is Oxygen. So it's a tool that allows you to encode uh, in TAI. And so to do the encoding, what we have been we have been using Oxygen, and I can just give you just a, a, a screenshot of uh, Oxygen, and this is the, the kind of code we do, so we need to encode the fragments using this, so to capture the variations, okay? And then, we store it in a Dropbox. That's, that's nice. And we'll see there the Dropbox with all the fragments, all the XML fragments where people have been working. This is nice because uh, they work in Coimbra, I'm in Lisbon, so they, they put it in the Dropbox. There's an error, I go there and see what is happening. So it's, it was very, uh, very nice to work this way, okay? It's, um, so that's the, that's the encoding. Then, after you encode this, so the file actually is, Dropbox is represented by this, so it is a, a fancy technical way to represent Dropbox. Okay, so 
what we do next. <laughs> so we can make things a bit more complicated than they really are. Uh, what you do next is just we import things. And that's the main, one of the main differences between our system and the most traditional systems for um, encoding this in TI because to have all this dynamic, uh, dynamic behavior, you need to have this in a different kind of repository. Actually, we need, you need to move it to an object-oriented repository. And so importing is a process where we parse, basically. We parse these files and we try to check if there are errors. So if there are errors, we just give an error, and we store the information using a different format, a different structure in this repository. So when you import, so you, we parse, we, we wrote a parser. It's not a complete parser of the TEI uh, language. It's just the, the small part that you need for the project. Actually, actually, I've been writing this parser on a need basis. So if you need something, and just we extend our parser to understand that part. And we provide very nice errors like this one. So you are encoding, and you submit the file, and you parse and receive. Uh, you forget to write something. Uh, you forget to have the value for the attribute target of element ref. OK. And then you just go to the, to the, so to the file again, and you change this till you get, you get something that is parsed. And we expect. We think that th this helps a lot because you are encoding and you have feedback and so you, you, you try, you improve things and you get a better encoding without errors. Then what you do, you visualize. So sometimes you are able to parse things but they are not correct yet because, okay, they are synthetically correct but then you need to read the result. And it's nice to read the result on the tool that is going to be the the tool that end users are going to use, because then if it is, works there, it's going to work at the end. So that's, that's one advantage of using this. We call this prototyping approach. And so visualize things using the prototype. So the idea is that then you can see the fragment in something, in a, in a place like this. So, so you use the oxygen tool to encode the fragment, then you parse the fragment, and then you go to the tool, to the final tool to read the things if everything is okay. And actually you discover that there are small mistakes that be, need to be corrected. That's the, the word love in Portuguese, but for some, some, some reason A is different from, so there's a split there, there's an error there. And then if you realize that, you, co you come back to the encoding tool and you encode things. So that's basically the workflow, okay? And then you correct. And you correct, you need to move there again. So I would say that what this is what people have been doing for two years now. OK? So the main difference, I don't know if that's the main difference, right? That, but at least we need to talk with people from other projects. But since we have this dynamic behavior, one difference is that we are using this prototype. So we have this workflow. It's a bit different than just doing the encoding. And probably do, working about the presentation afterwards. At least we try to emphasize this, this kind of workflow. And then just to present to the end user interaction. So the end user interaction is what we expect is going to happen after, when the, the, the project finishes and the, the, the site is, uh, uh, is published online. Okay? So the end user approach so only occurs basically there. So that was what I've been showing you is that the end user visualizes the fragments, visualizes the editions, and edit the editions. So you visualize and edit the edition. So visualize is just see for the fragment, and by editing an edition, it's just tagging the edition, so putting more, or, or creating his own editions, so that's editing, okay? And then, so that's the example we have already seen. So I'm in this virtual edition, and I'm editing uh, a fragment, and then what happens after a while is that the information that is there when you start editing is from different from the information that the the scholar produced. So because of that, since we have an importer, you created an exporter tool. 
So it would be nice because in TEI, uh, one of the goals to, to EI is to have interchange, okay? It's, it'd be nice to come back to TEI and produce TEI. This is interesting, so we can just use another thing and is an exporter. And the exporter, we can export to TI. And what we can do is that we can decide to export a single fragment, a complete edition, two fragments. Actually, you have not implemented everything yet, but it would be nice to say, even to, to decide what kind of encoding we are going to use in the, the, because there are different uh, uh, strategies for encoding. So you can just produce TI or export according to different strategies. But I'm going to show you that I, yesterday, I exported not the complete archive because I exported this in my local machine. So I think I don't have the, all the fragments there. But when I export the fragments that I have locally, I, re, I, I, re, I generated a file with something like 230,000 230, lines of uh, TI code, okay? So, and that's it, I think. Um, okay. Thank you. Questions? Perguntas? Domande? Mick, Mick, Mick. Okay, Chris. Um, you said at the beginning you're about to fail. What is the failure bit? Because it looks amazing. So we well, want to understand what, is, uh, what you meant by failing, because that is fabulous. Well, actually, the, the, the project is so complex and it's developed uh, in such an unexpected way because when we started off in, in 2010 when I first submitted the proposal, uh, the whole the idea was just to create comparisons between the editions and then the whole idea of the virtual editing and there's even a virtual writing layer which we have not talked about you know, in which uh, users will be able to write their own variations based on Pessoa's text uh, so uh, it, it, the, actually, I, I don't know if that's the, 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 the reason. You, you'll have to judge no, whether it fails or not, because the, the, maybe some of the functionalities that we want to uh, have, uh, as I was thinking, I was thinking about this, uh, I've, I've thought about this several times, and when I uh, put that question to you earlier, was how then we get people to actually use this. No? That, that is a problem that we are addressing. No? And we want to start building communities to see how the virtual uh, functions can be used. No? We've already made a few tests uh, with a group of users, but we want to explore all the levels of possibilities that we see here. No? Like, I think this could be useful for scholars, but also for students and even for the general reader. But we have to make it uh, readable uh, uh, because it's a very complex uh, thing. And one of the things we are uh, trying to develop is the, uh, an interface that is uh, friendly enough uh, so that it doesn't scare people away. So there's, uh, it, as, as, a, as, as I thought about the, the project, I, I realized that the complexity is so huge that we can fail uh, at different levels, no? Because we can fail uh, if we don't control all the coding and all the transcriptions that we are doing, no? We, and so, and actually I was scared when he told me that there were not, not the complete uh, uh, XML uh, files, but the ones that he has in his computer already total 230,000 lines. So the, the ones I have is 400. 400. So. And so I'm, I'm, right now I'm uh, going through all those lines so <laughs> you can see the amount of uh, failure that uh, could happen. But I think also it could fail on the level of actual use. No? And so that's very important for us is that the project is not a project that just sits there and it was some, something that we tried and then no one really picked it up. 
Uh, so that's, but the, and, and the technical part is difficult, no? The, the technical part is difficult. <laughs> Okay, I did it. Okay, just a, a, maybe a technical question, but it's really interesting what you are, are doing now. Uh, are you thinking to export in a, some semantic uh, version of, uh, of your work? I mean, to use some semantic web technologies or to export uh, uh, annotation in a semantic dimension? Uh, as soon as we decide to have this export functionality, now we are generating only Tay, okay? But we can export to anything we want. So as soon as we have the information there, you can uh, export to different kind of. Uh, so that's, a, that, that's the advantage of parsing Tay to something that we can manage our way, and then we can export to other kind of things. But now annotation, uh, how do you do you manage annotation? Well, I mean, the, the annotations you are transform them into tape. In, into tape. Okay. Okay. Annotations in tape. Okay. Some other question? That should be this button. Yeah. Hi. Uh, well, just like Elena, I'm just amazed by the work you've done, and I mean the amount of work, the possibilities you offer. I still wonder how many people will play with that magnificent toy? Do, do you have an estimation of who could be interested and also who would have the brains to do it? I, I think that's one of the problems that we need to address and we are trying to address that. We've conceived of a second stage of the project which is precisely, uh, is precisely geared towards getting, building uh, different types of communities. So we are thinking about working with a secondary school uh, group. Uh, the Book of Disquiet has been recently introduced in the 12th year curriculum. So in, uh, at the end of the high school, students will be reading the Book of Disquiet. So we want to have a, um, a secondary school group and test and work with them uh, during uh, one semester or something like that. And also we want to have a university group uh, who's working on Pessoa and on the Book of Disquiet. And we will try to get feedback from these experiments and tests so that we uh, redesign or improve uh, some failure of communication that our project may have. You know? Because it's very difficult when we have this complexity to make it uh, readable for, for an outsider. You know? Like the, the, the tests, we, we've done a series of tests in September uh, with, a with a group of 15 users, different uh, levels of expertise, uh, so experts, students, uh, secondary school teachers. And we realized like, we realized like the, the virtual level is un uh, un it's very difficult for people to understand what's the virtual edition. And so that's something that we have to work on. But um, ideally, no, we would like to see this being used by people who want to research the Book of Disquiet, no, like make analysis of the editions, for instance. No? Because one of the things that we realize is that all of the editors have written prefaces of presenting their editions, but there are criteria uh, they don't mention. And once we compare the editions, we begin to uh, strip naked you know, some of those criteria and see that they've made some silent corrections and systematized. Uh, so we, you, you can see what they've done. But I, I, would, I would like it to be used by students as well, you know, and even by uh, lay people. Now, we, I, I would also <laughs> like it to be readable, you no, know, readable. Uh, as, as a, an, an, an entry into the, the, the actual literary text itself. So it's not a scholarly archive that is meant to be scholarly on, only, but I want, because the, the book is absolutely fabulous, fa um, amazing, no? the, the text, the, the, the thoughts. No? And so I want, uh, I, I do not want to scare away someone who f discovers the book of disquiet uh, this, through this channel for the first time. And so there's a lot of things that could fail. <laughs> Thank you. 
Two questions. First, you talk about fragments. Uh, there is, um, what is the logical level of fragments? Are they all uniforms or there are different type of fragments? So you have a category for them. And second, if you don't, if you do remember correctly, when you presented the project in, uh, in Rome during the TI meeting, you said you are using a, a Java framework for publishing. Do you remember what it was, Spring or Struts or something like that? And so it's underlined there is an object-oriented repository. Uh, so you have a mapping from the TI encoding to the object-oriented database. Uh, do you have formalized this kind of, of mapping? Because this could be very interesting. I've used, you, you pass from an XML encoding to an object-oriented, and this could be useful also for other projects which try to formalize markup in a semantic, in a semantic way. Yes, actually, I don't know if I can find it in a short, but actually, we, in, in, um, in the article that has gone, is going to appear in, a, in Journal of Tay, we present the UML model then the, of this, actually. We are using Spring, okay, we are using Spring, and the object-oriented database is something that was implemented or designed by a colleague of mine at, in, at my university. So it's a software, actually, it's open source, it's called Phoenix Framework and uh, simplifies a bit the work about having, um, migrating this. But that's the, that's the idea. So the idea is to, is to move from there to there and you do most of the work there. I think this is necessary because when you have Tay, so Tay is something that is in a file. It would be pretty difficult to have a dynamic change of this file, especially if you want the web to uh, a web.0, a web uh, 2.0 environment where several people is working in, in, at this at the same time. So we need to move this from there to there, okay? And uh, that's, but then we preserve the idea of interchange because we export things. I don't know if I completely answer your question. Uh, so, so to address the question of fragment, no, the, the we, we, uh, we've also written a, uh, um, an article about that, and it's under review still. But fragments in Pessoa, it, we, we can find different types of fragments, no, in the sense that some fragments are fragmentary because they are unfinished, but you can also think of the fragment as a literary form of composition. And I think most of, one of the characteristics of the Book of Disquiet is that most of the texts are, in my view, are like one sitting, no? You would sit and write a text for a few hours and, and then the next time it would start a new fragment. And so it, it was not uh, continuing, no? It was not like a work. Some people have tried to, to read the Book of Disquiet as a, a, a novel, but it's very difficult to make that argument because it was not really uh, continuing what he had written before. It was starting all over again. And so each composition is an individual composition, although you can find some sort of threads, you no, know, a few threads of uh, references and images and ideas and thoughts, but is always starting and, and the fragment, I think, is also, it's not just the, the resulting from the fact that some of the pieces are unfinished and, are, and they are uh, fragmentary in terms of the composition uh, because they've not been revised, etc. But also, I think, the fragment is a unit of a composition. And actually, the, mo the fact that the book has this modular structure may, make it, made it an ideal uh, object for this experiment, you no? Know? Although some people may claim that we overemphasize the fragmentary nature of the book by just uh, breaking it up into all these XML files. But that's a consequence of our interpretation and also of the technology. Okay, so just what you have done is that this is basically the main entity, which is a uh, book of disquiet, and so we say, what you say is that the book of disquiet is made of a set of fragments, and each fragment has several interpretations. And you consider two kinds of interpretations. Source interpretation, that is what we are doing, and uh, expert interpretations. So this is the, the idea, and then if you have a source interpretation, it's related with a source. If you have a frag, an expert interpretation, is related with an expert edition. 
uh, we have this model. That, that's the object-oriented model that is in. And that's, that's the part that is more taste-specific, the, the readings and the, the, the apparatus. Well, uh, the time for this part is uh, over. <laughs>